The River Doamish, Washington State, in 1975. The red barn, William Boeing's first factory built in 1909, is being moved downstream to be restored as the Museum of Flight. One of Boeing's first employees recalls his early days. I'm Mike Pagoni and I was born in 1903, the same year that uh, Model Wright blew at Kitty Hawk. And uh, ever since I can remember, when I was six years old, I, uh, I passed an airplane over here on Harbor Island, and I was fascinated by it. And a couple of years later, my uh, dad and I, you know, I, we went to South Tacoma to see the horse races, and uh, we passed an airplane there that was uh, taking up rides for people. And uh, my dad had to jerk me out of there and go to the horse races. And ever since then, I, I was really fascinated with the, with the aircraft. And uh, later, I, uh, when I got through school, I, I went down to Boeing's and I uh, hired in in 1920 as an apprentice mechanic. And uh, that was the start of my career there with uh, aviation. William Boeing was born in Detroit in 1881 of wealthy German parents. Educated in Switzerland and at Yale, he moved to the Pacific Northwest in 1903. Having already developed a love of fast cars and boats, the events at Kitty Hawk implanted a new challenge, the challenge of flight. But it was not until 1915, when he met Conrad Westerfeld of the US Navy, that his dream would be realized, when, after buying a Martin seaplane and dismantling it, they decided they could build a better one. This is where it all began. The BMW, built in 1916, 13 years after the Wright brothers. There were two of them built. One of them was exported to New Zealand. The other one remained here in Seattle. The BMWs were shown to the US Navy, who suggested various modifications for use as a trainer. And as America entered the war, they placed an order for 50 of the craft. for the Boeing C, as it was designated, soon waned as the war drew to a close, and Boeing had to ride out the stump using his own resources, at one stage making furniture and sea sleds. It is now 1923, and Boeing has developed a system of arc-welding steel tubes to replace the timber then in use. And it was the success of this new construction method and the company's aggressive pursuit of military orders that made it, by 1927, one of the largest aircraft companies in the USA. Throughout the late 20s and 30s, William Boeing continued to develop the company. His perfectionism and ability to choose the right associates were his greatest assets. The company continued to attract orders for fighter and military training aircraft, as well as building a series of seaplanes for the US mail service. In 1927, Boeing outbid all competition for this lucrative service between San Francisco and Chicago. And although bankruptcy was predicted by his rivals, the Type 40 mail plane, which carried passengers as well as considerable amounts of mail, saved the day. Twenty-four were rushed into service in just two years of operation, carrying 1,300 tons of mail and 6,500 passengers. Boeing had set new standards and still made a profit. 
From these profits, he went on to form his own airline, Boeing Air Transport, later to be called United Airlines. There followed a series of innovations both in design and airline management. The Model 80 airliner became the first to carry a stewardess. Then, in 1930, came the Model 200 monorail. Only two were built, but the method of construction using duralium spars and sheeting was to have a far-reaching effect on the industry. It marked the death knell of the biplane airliner. Owing much to the monorail, Boeing then developed the Model 247, which first flew in 1933. It was, however, overshadowed by its commercial rival, the Douglas DC-3. Boeing's then began a series of super-large aircraft, something they were to become famous for. In 1938 came the Boeing Tipper, which set new standards of passenger comfort and became the pioneer of long-haul flight. It was the experience gained building huge aircraft such as the Tipper and the darkening war clouds over Europe that encouraged Boeing to enter the field of large bomber aircraft. The 294, at the time the largest aircraft in the world, was developed from an earlier model designated the 299. Although grossly underpowered, they were to be the stepping stones to one of the most famous aircraft to see service in the Second World War. to realize that the government specification for a multi-engined aircraft could mean four and recommended that the company should go ahead with the design of the 299. Its ability to sustain battle damage had a lot to do with the construction techniques used initially on the monomail. The aircraft was built in separate components and could be assembled in units or by subcontractors, thus making it possible to produce large numbers of aircraft from relatively small factories. The B-17 had been born, and with America's eventual involvement in the Second World War, production began in earnest. Well, of course, we were working uh, three shifts a day and, and uh, basically seven days a week which certainly contributed to the high rate. Uh, uh, and we had uh, lots of people, you know, uh, and it was very noisy. Uh, but it, was, uh, it wasn't really confusing. Uh, we had the wing line, and we had the engine shop, and, you know, we had the final assembly, and, you know, it was just very compact. And, of course, it grew with the rate, uh, you know. Many of the changes were changes dictated by experience in combat. Uh, the first of these, of course, uh, most obvious was the tail turret, which uh, was installed first on the B-17E, and then the additional armament and revisions to armament uh, were made all throughout the, the life of the program to uh, add the firepower where it was needed, or to add armor plate, or uh, protection of various kinds uh, as required by combat experience. Using hindsight, of course, you could have designed it as a B-52, <laughs> but without hindsight, uh, there aren't very, very many changes that appeared to be necessary that didn't get made.
B-17 was to become a familiar sight in eastern England. Nearly 13,000 were to be built, mainly by Boeing, but also with the help of subcontractors Douglas and Lockheed. Over 5,000 were lost in combat, yet it accounted for over 6,500 enemy planes, nearly half the total shot down by US aircraft. And it was a bomber, not a fighter. It is one of the ironies of war that if William Boeing's father, Wilhelm, had not chosen to emigrate to America, Boeing's might well have been flying alongside Heinkel's and Dornier's. In 1985, on the 50th anniversary of the B-17, some of the wartime air crews met again in Seattle. Oh, that was cold. Your hands would freeze. Heavy. Your feet would get cold. Yeah. Your frostbitten. The old masks would leak. Now ice for two inches thick, right along here. They once said that uh, two gunners in here is like uh, two guys with jackhammers in a telephone booth. We had to, uh, we took turns, you know, we had to make sure that we were out of each other's way. We were always bumping rears. And then the cartridge is on the floor. It's like a roller coaster. Two fighters, six o'clock, coming in, down and out, team. He sent me in trouble out at two o'clock, watching. Got an engine on fire. sad fact of life that an invention as potentially beneficial as the aircraft should be used for the wholesale destruction of man. Sean Genet, a poet of the 40s, wrote, Suddenly at night the bombers came in the hard reverberating bowl of the sky, destroying the factory and the tall cathedral, the dock, the warehouse and the railway station, the rich house in the leafy avenue and the sheltering tenements of the narrow streets and the bodies and souls of men. I sought my son among the smoking stones where I had crouched with him clutched at my breast until the bomb burst and the building shattered down and the dark came and severed my son from me. I cried out with a voice harsh in my throat my son, I have lost my son. You ask about being scared? Yes, we were scared. We were thankful we were coming back because we lost a few of the boys there.
B-17Fs and started going in deep penetration. The uh, uh, we didn't have fighter escorts to go very far. We had P-47s, but they'd only go in a short ways, and uh, then they'd have to leave us, and then the Germans would take over, and uh, uh, it scared us to death. We've ever been going down a highway about 60, 70 miles an hour, and some guy swerves over, and you get that feeling through you that you're going to be hit. Well, that's that feeling you have for hours at a time. And after a while, it's just, uh, you just accept it. It's like hanging. You take hang it and you're used to it. That's as I want to They were able to go higher than our other bombers, for one thing. So that put the war up higher. And, uh, and that was all, all to the good, because it got us up uh, at least part of the way out of the flak and stuff. So the B and the B-17, of course, was able to take, I think, more punishment than any of the rest of our bombs. Well, I, I don't think that uh, they were thinking about uh, the, the strength of the airplane. They just knew that they had a weapon, and it was the only weapon that they had, and they were going to use it. And they did use it, and they used it with extreme effectiveness. It happened when, soon after takeoff, on the return, almost made it. It ended for Ralph, Jack, Richard, Carl, Randolph, Russell, Louis. Here, here in this Norfolk field, the bite of metal on this too unsolid flesh. The stone of passing interest to walkers in the summer, buffeted by the eastern winds, still warrants flowers from someone. Good as the B-17 was, the US Army had a need for a high-altitude pressurized bomber. Before the war, Boeing had developed the Stratoliner with a supercharger and a sealed fuselage. Four were even ordered by Pan American as passenger airliners. But the prototype stalled and crashed on March the 18th, 1939. As a result, new fins were fitted, and with the experience gained with the B-17, the Model 294 and the Stratoliner led, in 1942, to the B-29 bomber. With its pressurized crew compartments and its four right engines, it was capable of well over 700 knots at a service height of 32,000 feet. It was the heaviest combat aircraft to enter service in World War II and was used mainly in the Pacific, becoming involved in various heavy raids on the Japanese mainland. August the 6th, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay took off from Tinian. Piloted by Colonel Paul Tippetts, it dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. It devastated the city, killing over 75,000 people. On August the 9th, a second B-29 dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. Mara Tamiki, a Japanese poet of the 40s, who suffered radiation burns and sickness and who later committed suicide, wrote, In the fire, a telegraph pole, 
at the heart of the fire, a telegraph pole like a stamen, like a candle, blazing up like a molten red stamen. In the heart of the fire, on the other bank from the morning, one by one, fear screamed through men's eyes. At the heart of the fire, a telegraph pole, like a stamen. For flyers, the age of innocence was finally over. The dream had turned into a nightmare. Prior to and during the war, development work had taken place in Europe on the gas turbine engine. And by 1945, a number of single and multi-engine jet aircraft had been flown in Great Britain and Germany. Amongst them, the famous ME-262, which the B-17s were to meet during the closing stages of the war. In 1943, the United States Army Air Force had issued its requirements for a jet bomber, and in 1945, with access to the work in Germany, as well as its own research, Boeing started development of the B-47, which first flew in 1947. With its high aspect ratio wing and six engines, it presented its pilots with many problems. The wing could flex as much as 17 feet at its tip, and at certain altitudes, moving the stick back would result in a slow speed stall, and moving it forward resulted in high speed buffeting, which became known as coffin corner. A British designer said of the B-47, it had little control at high speed, had to be landed through a letterbox, and would never be accepted at Boscombe Down, the British Aircraft Evaluation Centre. But yet again, valuable lessons were learned and put into use in its successor, the B-52. the B-47 and B-52 was to stand Boeing in good stead for the commercial battles to come. Production director Joseph Sutter continues the story. Going back to World War II, I remember Boeing uh, got heavily involved in bombers, B-17s and B-29s for the war effort, and that really put Boeing out of the commercial business for several years. 
At the end of the war, uh, Boeing, with the desire of getting back in the commercial business, first developed an airplane derived from the B-29 using that wing, and it used a very, very large reciprocating uh, engine. But jets had started development in World War II, and over in England, uh, de Havilland, uh, using a ghost engine developed by, by their own company, was developing the Comet. Uh, Boeing was watching um, that activity very hard. Uh, Boeing, meanwhile, had developed the B-47 bomber, which was a pure jet. And it was obvious that the jet engine was going to produce a dramatic improvement in uh, reliability, uh, uh, performance, and uh, we believed in economics and in, uh, and finally in range when the engines quit burning so much fuel. Uh, the Comet uh, made quite an impression and pretty much proved that jet travel was uh, going to be far superior to struggling through the air at 20,000 feet in, in the clouds and slow speed. So uh, uh, when an engine came along that uh, looked like it was going to produce a, an efficient jet, uh, we immediately uh, began exploring the possibility of jet airplanes. Uh, Boeing first did it by using a Pratt Whitney engine and building a prototype. We called it the 367-80. It was actually the prototype of the uh, 707 airplane. It was built using Boeing's own fund. Only one airplane was built. It was never intended to certify it or put that particular model in service. It was to prove the concept. And uh, the Dash 80 really uh, made quite an impression and very quickly uh, developed into the 707 program. Uh, that first model was a, a intercontinental uh, model. New York to London was one of the prime routes. Pan American, British Airways uh, were a couple of the uh, key customers. Uh, that kept developing from model to model, and, and we, we finally built about 900 of, of those airplanes. And the 707 really uh, did a lot towards establishing long-haul jet travel. The 707 was to become one of the best known aircraft in the world and was to help in the development of a new military order, the KC-135 tanker, which was built for the United States Air Force and is seen here being rolled out for the first time in July 1956 alongside the KC-97, which it was designed to replace. Had it not been for the military orders, things could have been tough for Boeing. It was not until 1963 when over a thousand 707s had been sold, that the aircraft moved into profit. However, Boeing's next aircraft, the medium haul 727, was to become the world's best-selling airliner, with nearly 2,000 entering service around the world. With the smaller 737, together they formed the backbone of major airlines. Uh, 707 and, and a much greater acceptance of air travel um, it was obvious that if that efficiency could be built in other airplanes uh, the whole air transportation system could take off and uh, produce quite a bit of uh, benefits to everybody including profits to the operators so uh, Boeing then pursued me medium haul airplanes like the 727 and finally all the way down to the little 737 so the jets really covered the whole field um, air travel really did take off because of the jets and it was obvious that uh, the next step is to uh, try and satisfy a bigger market uh, demand. More people wanted to travel, uh, the cost of air travel was still a little bit too high. Uh, the way to improve that is to go after um, uh, better efficiency, which meant improved engines and better aerodynamics, better structure, and larger capacities. Uh, Boeing in discussing uh, the situation with the, uh, the major uh, potential customers, was amazed to find out uh, that the airplanes we were thinking of were too small. And that really was the, um, 
and bringing into being of an airplane the size of the 747. That, was, that size was not picked by Boeing, it was picked by uh, airlines like Pan American, British Airways, Lufthansa, Japan Airlines. And uh, it, it was quite a shock to uh, we engineers when they asked us to produce an airplane uh, that large, especially with a brand new style of engine called a high bypass ratio engine. And, and you have to give a lot of credit to the engine manufacturers. Without those kind of engines, we couldn't be making the type of airplanes like the 747. But the combination of a very efficient high bypass ratio engine, also it gave us the ability to lift that capacity into the air. That produced uh, operating economics. That really produced air transportation as we know it today. It was a very, very bold gamble. Um, we, Boeing was putting the net worth of the company online. Uh, it exhausted Boeing's resources and uh, uh, Boeing got pretty thin financially at the time we delivered the first 747. I think that kind of a gamble uh, would be hard to take today. On February the 9th, 1969, after days of sub-zero conditions, the 747 and its crew were ready for the first flight. The rain and cold conditions still threatened, and the hope for break in the weather did not materialize. They waited for a break in the clouds that covered Painfield Everett, Washington State. Then, just before noon, the hoped for break in the clouds came, and the 747's crew decided to attempt a takeoff. In less than a thousand yards of runway, the 16 wheeled, 317 ton largest passenger aircraft in the world took to the air. After a little over an hour's flying, the 747 heads for home. It was to be the beginning of a new era of jet transport, carrying more people further and faster.
program uh, had a lot of problems with it. Uh, it uh, some what got involved with uh, national objectives, which didn't make economic sense. And uh, Boeing was developing a, a very good and efficient SST, uh, but frankly, it didn't have enough range or capacity to offer supersonic flight at the economic level that would allow enough people to buy a ticket. And that really is why the SST disappeared in the mid-1970s. It was competing against the uh, 747, and there, there was no competition. Uh, there is improvements in technology. Uh, the engine manufacturers know uh, potentially what kind of engine we need. It will be a tremendous investment in that kind of engine and airplane. And uh, it'll come, but it's still going to be a long ways off because of the, the terrific, very, very large amount of, uh, of uh, financial uh, input into the program, but it'll happen. In 1960, Boeing acquired the Vertol Aircraft Corporation in Morton, Pennsylvania. Frank Piasecki had developed and flown a large tandem rotor helicopter in 1945. At the time, the largest helicopter built carrying 10 passengers. Various developments followed, resulting in the H-21 series, known in the Army as the Flying Banana, seen here working on offshore posts that serve as part of the early warning system for the United States. large capacity, they did valuable rescue work during the Andrea Doria disaster and during the floods in Mexico. From the flying banana, Boeing went on to develop the Chinook battlefield helicopter, 550 of which were used in Vietnam. By now, the company had grown from just 21 at the old Red Barn to over 130,000, some of whom are working on the new generation of jet transports. Red and Boeing 757 is ready to taxi into position. Boeing 757, proceed on the runway. 757. When 170 at 20. Thank you. Basically checked the airplane at all flap settings, all speeds uh, below 250 knots. We checked uh, initial buffet at each flap setting, and we checked the uh, max placker speed at each flap setting. Also, we uh, retracted and lowered the gear. Very routine flight. <laughs> it was fantastic in the fact that everything went just as programmed. Couldn't have written a better script. So far, uh, from what we've well, it's a very nice handling airplane. It's a very straightforward, honest, nice handling airplane. Uh, this is uh, Boeing 757 Experimental. Boeing 757 Experimental, Payne Tower. 
uh, we'd like to turn inbound for your airport. 757 Experimental, Roger. Wind 190 at 20, peak gust 38. Altimeter 29 or 9 or 1. Roger, 2991. has a new rival in the marketplace, this time from Europe, in the shape of the Airbus, similar to the 757 and the latest 767. Boeings have a curious stake in their new rival. The parts for the Airbus, produced by various companies in Europe, are flown to the assembly sites in Germany by the Guppy, a rather strange aircraft based on the Boeing Stratocruiser. Contact the departure 119.5. Good day. Thank you very much. We'll be talking to you again soon. But it is perhaps the workhorses, the 707s, 727s, and 747s, that have helped to shrink the world, enabling people to meet and to travel and to achieve one of mankind's oldest dreams to fly.